is Terry Lee. I'm one of the pastors here at the Oaks Church. I invite you to find 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, that's where we're going to be spending our time this morning. Um, if you're here and you do not have a Bible, I uh, want you to grab one on the Connect table as a gift from us. You can either do that now or before you leave. Um, one of the things that we think is really important here at the Oaks is uh, teaching from God's Word, praying through God's Word, singing uh, the themes of God's Word, and so hopefully you've already picked up on that a little bit this morning, but uh, this morning will be extremely more valuable to you if you can follow along in a copy of God's Word, and so we have those available to you, uh, and also have them on the screen behind me. Let me ask you a question as we get started, and that question is, have you ever done anything foolish, right? You could probably think, absolutely. As I was getting ready to prepare this sermon this morning, uh, you know, I'm just going through my notes and, and trying to think, and so I asked Abby, I said, hey, can you think of a time that I've done anything foolish? Um, husbands, let me go ahead and tell you, uh, find a comfortable place to sit before asking a question with such a lengthy response. Um, no, but seriously, we all want to seem wise, don't we? Uh, I mean, from the moment that you were first in elementary school and you had that thrill of knowing the answer before every other kid in your class and your hand shot up and you're wiggling in your seat and you're doing something like, ooh, ooh, ooh you know, or like when test scores go around. And, you know, the kids are like slumping in their seat and you did really well and you're smiling and you're just kind of like, oh, I hope somebody asked me what I got on this test. We want to feel smart. Even now, we want people to look at our financial decisions and be like, that was a good move. We want people to see the way that we handle relationships and think that person is pretty wise. We love letters after our names, degrees on our walls. Even whenever someone asks us for advice, we can't help but feel a little bit superior because at least for a brief moment, we feel like we are the authority on that subject or that topic. We all want to be wise. We don't want to appear foolish. And what we find as Christians is this creates kind of a unique tension in life. Uh, because the very label of Christian invites criticism. It, it, it is actually seen as foolish for many in our world. Uh, some of us have, have told uh, a fellow classmate, uh, a professor, uh, a family member around the dinner table that we identify with Christ, and someone has said, you mean to tell me you actually believe that this man who died 2,000 years ago uh, has the ability to unite you with God. He resurrected from the dead and is going to return one day to take you to a place called heaven. And our answer should be, for those of us who identify as Christian, absolutely. But we wrestle with the tension, right? We find ourselves trying to navigate how do I, I hold my academic accomplishments and, and, and longing to be seen as smart and intelligent, yet dealing with something that most of the world would call foolish. How do I reconcile that tension? And what we find is that we're not the first people to deal with that. In fact, Paul would write to the church in Corinth, and one of the things that they were becoming divided over as a young church is how to view wisdom, specifically as Jimmy taught on last week. There were these guys who would come in and they would speak and they would preach and they sounded really, really wise. They would use these stories that would evoke emotion. They would use these, uh, you know, almost syllogism and arithmetic and all of this logic that really piqued the senses and, and appealed to the intellectual elite. And people were thinking, well, well I want to be on that team. But so many people think that because I believe that a crucified man is my way to salvation, they think I'm foolish. How do I deal with that tension? And what we're going to see today is that Paul speaks directly to us so that we could understand that the wisdom and power of God is indeed displayed in the cross of Christ. And we would do well to look nowhere else. So if you have a copy 
of God's Word. Meet me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Paul says, For the word of the cross is folly, foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. What I want us to take away from this passage this morning is that the message of the cross defies our wisdom. It determines our worth and it directs our words. The message of the cross that we would be saved through what appears like weakness defies the wisdom of the world. This is why God chose to not make himself known through wisdom. This determines our worth. Because Christ died for us, we are in Christ. He is our wisdom. He is our righteousness. He is our sanctification. He is our redemption. And finally, this is going to direct our words. Not only is whoever is standing up here proclaiming the message of the gospel every single week, It determines the very words that we cling to and that our faith rests in as believers. I want you to see that the message of the cross is so central to our faith that to misunderstand the cross is to not understand Jesus at all. Uh, This is why John Stott would write, It was by his death that Jesus wished above all else to be remembered. There is, then, it is safe to say, no Christianity without the cross. If the cross is not central to our religion, ours is not the religion Jesus. We cling to the cross, we preach the cross, and find our identity rooted in the cross. The first thing that I want you to see from uh, verses 18 through 25 is that this is our wisdom The power of the cross seems foolish to the world, but it is the power of God to those who believe. It seems foolish to the world, but to those who believe, it is the power of God. I want you to imagine that that you are living in Corinth in the first century. Uh, This place was a port city. It was extremely busy. I want you to imagine that you're walking to your place at the market. You're setting up shop there. Maybe you deal some kinds of of goods that people would benefit from. Let's say that you've got a produce stand, and you're on your way. And as you're on your way, you're bumping into people that are speaking different languages. Uh, You see the ports full of sailors coming in. As you pass through the town square, you would see something that you saw almost every day. Uh, There were these guys who would stand up on platforms, and they would talk about whatever was going on. Uh, so news articles, news updates, uh, you know, every, everything that we find coming through our phones didn't exist. Netflix wasn't there. So how would people be entertained? How would people hear about new ideas? How would people be updated on what was going on around the world? They would go to the town square and they would hear these speakers get up and, and give these words of, of lofty wisdom and eloquent speech. Now as you're standing there, you see a man that perhaps you haven't seen before. He he begins walking up the steps, and you notice it's one of the guys who works a a couple booths down from you in the market. He's a tent maker. He's new in town. He's he's preaching a message that he calls the gospel, speaking about a man who is named Jesus Christ. He, He kind of hobbles up the steps and clears his throat. 
and in the shadow of pagan temples, begins to declare the greatest message that had ever been heard. He scans the crowd, sees the bustling streets, and, and then says, people of Corinth, there's a way to deal with that guilt. People of Corinth, there's a way to deal with that shame. People of Corinth, the fear that you have of the future, there is hope in the midst of that darkness. With people hanging on his word, he goes on to say, and that hope is a man named Jesus. Uh, some people have heard, some people are confused. He says, Jesus is he's the son of God. Existing eternally, but born from a virgin. Already he's losing some people, but, but you're gripped by his word, so you keep listening. He's, 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 he was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. Attempted in every way, yet without blemish. And he went to the cross. Oh, for some of the Greeks, the mention of the cross would have been just disgusting. You don't talk about the cross in public. Uh, imagine him mentioning the cross and mothers begin cupping their hands over child's ears because you just don't talk about something so gruesome and bloody and yet this would be the way that this guy is proclaiming salvation to the world? Some would say this message is foolish. I'm united to God through that. Paul would go on. He was crucified at the hands of lawless men, laid in a tomb that was only borrowed and three days later he would rise again, declaring salvation to whoever would believe. And as Paul locked eyes with some of the people in that crowd, some of them were rolling. They're like, no, are you kidding me? And others were filled with tears. The same message sent some people to believe it was the most ridiculous thing that they had ever Heard, and for others, they felt the shackles of sin and bondage released at the name of Jesus. How could that be? It is just as Paul has described here in verse 18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Um, Paul Gardner said that in this, he has shown that the world can be divided into two types of people. Those who find a crucified Christ foolish and those who find that in Christ lies the power and wisdom of God himself to call us and to save. It's hard for us to realize just how offensive the message of the cross would be, right? Because we see it all the time. I have crosses hanging on my wall at my house. I use them as decoration. Uh, some of us have crosses tattooed on our bodies. Maybe you have a cross hanging around your neck. And we lose the offense of the cross because to us, at this point in history, we know that it represents the life-giving work of Christ. But to them, this would have been the equivalent of tattooing an electric chair on your arm. Uh, this would have been like putting a poster of lethal injection above your dining room table. You would not have done that. And so whenever they hear the message of the cross, it is extremely offensive. And it would have seemed foolish to all kinds of people. Uh, the Olympian athletes who were there, they were working out for the Isthmian Games that came around every two years. These guys were jacked. Uh, these ladies were quick. They were strong. Do you think they want to hear about a weak-looking Jesus nailed on a cross? Think about the politicians in their day, followed by their entourage, who, who are being asked to believe in a man who in worldly terms never had a prominent title? Uh, think about those who, who would have been impressed by noble birth and airtight logic. Think about someone who was born to a peasant girl, seemingly without husband at the time. The Jews wanted signs and miracles, and, and Jesus said he was only going to bring one sign and miracle to them after his death, and that was the sign of Jonah. It just didn't match up. They thought it was foolish. And we can't pretend like this response is just a historic one. Uh, we can't pretend like this is just a way that people responded in the past. No, if you're sitting here this morning, and if you have heard the last five minutes of what I am saying, you are driven to one of two conclusions. 
of the cross is the power of God to save even me, or it is complete foolishness. Let me ask, do you think this message is foolish? Why do you think it's foolish? Is it because it seems outdated? Is it because you think that your sins aren't really that bad? Jesus would only have to die for people far worse than me. It's because you don't understand why Jesus had to die, that this is the only way that us as sinners could be reconciled to a holy God is to have a perfect substitute. I want you to look at verse 18. It says the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, I want you to know that I am extremely glad that you are here. And this is a place where you can ask a ton of questions. And, and not be looked down and not be judged. Right? Every single one of us who are believers have had a point in our faith where we are wrestling with a lot of these issues. And I want you to know that there is a place for you here for as long as it takes you to figure this out. But at the same time, I want to say there is great urgency in the fact that God's word says that those who think this is folly are perishing. That word perish dulls our senses to the reality at hand. Another way to translate this would be headed for ruin. That God will judge those who are far from him and those who have trusted in Christ. And the reality of those who do not know Christ is eternity in hell. Would you believe even this morning you say, God, help me to understand that the cross is Jesus in my place and it is the power of God for my salvation. You cannot save yourself. As close as you feel like you are to figuring it out, to being morally perfect, you're not. Trust in Christ. Perhaps uh, you're here this morning and you'd say, a, a lot of people think that I am foolish because I believe this. I want to give you three quick admonitions. First, don't be surprised. As you're sitting in your classroom and you feel like you're being labeled as narrow-minded or weak because you believe in the cross of Christ, know that Jesus said in John 15, 18, hey, the world hated me, they ridiculed me. Uh, they will do the same to you. Don't be, don't be surprised. At the same time, don't be angry. Don't be angry whenever people look down on you or think this is foolish. This is what this word has said to us. Uh, know that the Bible says that those who do not believe are blind. And so be gentle and compassionate, not angered, angry to those who do not understand. And, and third, don't be silent. Brothers and sisters, your image, your reputation, and your comfort is a small thing to sacrifice. Sacrifice so that others may be welcomed into the family of God. So don't be silent when it comes to the message of the cross, for it is the power of God to save. Paul uses the word power here to just show how it accomplishes the work and is the only thing that can accomplish the work of our salvation. Look at what Milton Vincent says when he refers to the power of the gospel. He says, indeed God, indeed, God's power is seen in erupting volcanoes, in the unimaginably hot boil of our massive sun, and in the lightning speed of a recently discovered star seen streaking through the heavens at 1.5 million miles per hour. Yet in Scripture, such wonders are never labeled the power of God. How powerful then must the gospel be that it would merit such a title and how great is the salvation it could accomplish in my life if I would only embrace it by faith and give it a central place in my thoughts each day. Do you see just how powerful the gospel is? Do you see why this is is the thing that we talk about every single week. This is why the thing that we point one another to in MC every single week, because the gospel is the power of God to save. If you are someone who underlines or highlights in your Bible, I invite you to underline these four words. But to us who are being saved, that line, who are being saved, it is the power of God. I want you to see that these verbs are passive, right? I'm going to invite you into a little 
English lesson here. Who is doing the acting? Not you. You are not saving yourself. You are not the one doing the saving. You are being saved. This is God acting on your behalf upon the cross. And if you can't earn it, you can't lose it. He is single-handedly gripping you. You are being saved. Second, I want you to see that this is ongoing. You are being saved. It is a progressive work that God is doing the saving. No, you are not yet who you will be. But by God's grace, you are not who you were. And tomorrow you will sin. You will mess up and know that God's grace and mercy will be there to greet you when you're staring at the ground in shame. That you are being saved. Also note the definitive way that Paul says this. He's not worried. He's not like, you are probably being saved. You know what? You guys are, I'm almost 100% certain that you are being saved. No, this is Paul's definitive Claim that Christ has acted on your behalf and you are being saved. And there's an empty tomb that proves it, that you are being saved. What a great encouragement to us who are in Christ, who struggle, who see this great disparity between who we want to be and who we are, that Christ indeed has done everything to save us. Paul here borrows one of the techniques in verse 20 from Socrates. If you know, there was a man, a philosopher named Socrates, who lived about 600 years earlier. And the way that that he would communicate or teach was not so much by giving facts, but yet by asking questions and drawing truths out of people. And so what Paul is going to do is he's going to ask a series of questions to try to direct the church in Corinth to his conclusion. He asks, where is the one who is wise in verse 20? This would have been the Greek. Where is the scribe? This would have been the one in the synagogue. Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? It's almost like he's playing a rhetorical game of hide and seek. It's saying, where are these guys and telling you how to get to God? They can't be found and they can't give an answer. At best, they can only manage the symptoms of the struggles that you deal with. And we see the same thing in our world, don't we? Uh, We know that it is only God who can bring change. Yet we, we say, be the change you wish to see in the world, as if we could actually do that. We encourage one another and say, just be yourself. Whenever scripture counts God saying, be holy as I am holy. Uh, We would watch someone like Dr. Phil give some fighting fair tips on TV and and want to apply those, yet are, are told that it's only God who can break down a dividing wall of hostility and mend a broken relationship. Uh, we, We would see that the banner ads on our Facebook page uh, would teach us that contentment can arrive on your doorstep only two days. Yet we know only Christ can satisfy. Where are the debaters of this age? Where is the wisdom of this world? Who is it that is going to teach us? And Paul says, God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. Verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, then how would they know him? Pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. How are we saved? Verse 21, those who believe, who hear the foolishness of preaching, right? How would you like that in your job description? That's me, right? Through the foolishness of preaching, those who believe are saved. And it is definitive. Now, why would people still reject? Look at verse 22. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. Some were saying, we want more miracles. Others were saying, no, we want airtight logic. Bodily resurrection has no place in in our naturalist idea of how things should work. Verse 24 comes along, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power 
of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. See, in the very weakest moment, uh, where God appeared to be weakest, Jesus hanging on the cross, it is actually God's moment of strength. In that moment that he looks weak, Jesus is single-handedly crushing sin, Satan, and death. It appeared foolish. The guards standing around Jesus saying, this guy said that he was God? They call up to him. Hey, why don't you just save yourself? And I wish that I was in the crowd in that moment. That I could run to that guard and say, he's not up there to save himself. He's up there to save me and you. And although it appears foolish, this is the power of God on display for our salvation. We can't understand exactly every detail of what God would do, but we know that this is the power of God and the wisdom of God for our salvation. So we find great comfort in the words of Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For God would say, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts, your thoughts. And for those of us who are perhaps confused and conflicted, who look at natural disasters in the world and don't understand why they would take place, who are dealing with chronic pain or perhaps uh, the harm of a loved one or even to ourselves and would, not, would wonder why is this happening, and we can look to the cross and see that one of the moments of what would seem like the worst tragedy in history would be, bring about the greatest news we could ever hear. God has made himself appear wise, even though the world would call it foolish. Pick up with me in verse 26. It says, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Here we find our worth. You see, the people of the cross seem foolish to the world, but are complete in Christ. This is what Paul is considering here in these verses that although we would seem foolish to the world, we are complete in Christ. You see, there was a unique culture in Corinth. It was one of the first places that you could move and kind of be your own person. Just because your dad was a blacksmith didn't mean that you have, had to grow up and be a blacksmith. Just because you were in one class system in another place, you could move to Corinth and be your own person. Much like the musician who moves to Nashville or the aspiring actor that moves to L.A. or the fashion designer who goes to Brooklyn. Like Corinth was the destination of the place where people wanted to go to make something of themselves. This, this idea, this viewpoint even worked its way into the church. They began thinking, well, other people think it's foolish, but now we actually understand the wisdom of God. We must be more humble uh, we must be more attuned to the supernatural. We must have more open minds if God has chosen to display this to us and not to the rest of the world. And they begin to be puffed up. And so Paul kind of puts them in their place in verse 26. He said, Consider your calling, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. He's like, you guys are... An embarrassment when we go to trivia night. You're, you're not that wise. Uh, I, I mean, look, you, you think that Apollos is awesome? Like, look at him in ninth grade with braces. This is kind of embarrassing for all of us. And this is like our, our preacher, you know? Not many of you were wise. Not many of you were of noble birth. Now, there were some exceptions. They had Crispus, who was formerly the leader of the synagogue. They had 
Erastus, who was the city treasurer. So, but I mean, even we have Justin Bieber. So like, we've got some winners on our team, right? Maybe not. I don't know. Jury's still out. But we would, we would admit for most of us, yeah, we, we, we didn't come from noble birth. We're not in the top five earners of our city. Nobody is super impressed with us. Yet God chose to make himself known to us. This is perhaps one of the most humbling things we could hear. That Paul would write, God chose three times, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are. Why? So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. You see, every single thing that we have has been given to us. This is why uh, John Calvin would write, in putting the strong and wise and great to shame, God does not exalt the weak and uneducated and worthless, but brings all of them down to one common level. And at the foot of the cross, there is no room for any one of us to boast. We are all on the same plane. What we could think would be Paul just delivering a serious burn to the church of Corinth is actually him elevating the grace of God. That we would stand here and agree with Charles Hodge. No one can stand in his sight and attribute his conversion or salvation to his own wisdom or birth or station, to anything else by which he is favorably distinguished from his fellow men. When you stand before Jesus' throne, you are only boast will be Christ. Because the wealthy can't pay a fee into the throne room of God. The intelligent can't pass an exam that will get them into God's presence. The debater of this age cannot construct an argument that is eloquent enough for God to say, you're welcome into my presence. The only way that we can come before God is through the blood of Christ shed on the cross. And this is our only hope. And this is why Paul would write, he is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let me ask, is this enough? That Christ has become your wisdom? Is that enough? That Christ has become your righteousness? That God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in him you might become the righteousness of God? That Christ has attributed his perfect righteousness? Is that enough? Is it enough that Christ would sanctify you, progressively making you more like him? Is it enough that he is the one that has redeemed you? Or do we still want what the world would say is intelligence or wisdom or popularity or a a favorable reputation? When people ask how your week is going, do you find yourself saying, super busy? Because if people just know I'm busy, then they'll think I'm important. Do you like to carry around a stack of books or or secretly hope that someone will ask you about your major or your job, or, or where you live, or what you drive, because that status symbol is what will define you? Or are you content to say, no, Christ is my source for everything, and that is where I find my being. That's my worth in Christ, in Christ alone. See, this would be exactly what Paul would preach and teach. Verse 1 in chapter 2, real quick, Paul says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We look at Acts 18, and we see Paul praying 
in the city of Corinth, and Jesus appears to him and says, do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. I have many people who are in this city, and you will not be harmed. We see that Paul was nervous as he takes the stage in a place where wisdom and eloquence was put on such a high pedestal. We see him using the philosophical rhetoric of the day when he is in Athens. We see him stringing along a a list of passages of scripture when he's in the synagogue, yet when he comes to Corinth, he decides to know one thing, Christ crucified. His message is not geared toward just winning people's favor or trying to manipulate them into an emotional response. He says, I'm only preaching Christ crucified. Why? Why would he do that? Verse 29, or verse 4, says, In my speech and my message were not plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let me ask, where is your faith resting this morning? Your faith, not the person sitting beside you, not, not your parents, not the kids you lead at Young Life or the person in your missional community. Where is your faith resting this morning? Is it resting in, well, I just, you know, my parents were Christians and so this is just kind of how we grew up and, and so this is just, I've always believed this. Or is it more of a cultural thing, right? This is the closest thing to a moral code that I would believe in. Christianity kind of meets that bill. So, so I'm a Christian. This is where my faith rests. Does your faith rest in checking a box on a connect card, walking down an aisle, being sprinkled with water or dunked in a tank? Where does your faith rest? Does your faith rest somehow in the wisdom and work of man or does it rest in Christ and the message of I pray that your faith rests in the cross. That your faith would rest in the sinless Savior being nailed to a tree. Absorbing the penalty of God and wrath in your place. That he would exhale with his last breath. It is finished. And that your only boast would be the cross of Christ. This morning you have to decide. Is this foolish or is this the power of God to save? Do I find this message foolish or is this my only hope in salvation? Let's pray. Father God, you are gracious to give us your word. Uh, Lord, this is a weighty message. Uh, Lord, your, your text, your word invites us to reflect on our lives. We cannot walk out of this room indifferent, complacent, or undecided. But I pray even now that if if there are those here in this room who have not placed their trust in you, that, that this would be the moment that they would say, I don't understand it all, but I know that I need Christ, and without him I am perishing. And that the message of the gospel would be like a cool glass of water upon their blistered lips. They would find that the truth of Christ revives the heart and renews the soul. Lord, for those of us who are Christians, Lord, we wouldn't say that we believe this message is foolish out loud, but, but how often do we keep from sharing it because we think other people will just say that we're foolish. Lord, I pray that you would give us boldness. Lord, I pray that you would remind us that you are continually saving us. May that lead us to a humble repentance and confession of sin during this time of communion. You would change us, that you would renew us, that you would be glorified by this time together. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.